Flogger Dome, Episode 12, Antinatalism and Ethelism, featuring Glynos, Derived Energy, The Music of Mike Bull, Vox Neruda, Metamorph, and the music of Mistro. So we now head for the final frontier. Yeah, the subject, the big subject. What's it all about? Uh, what's it mean to be alive? Human, on Earth, in the universe. Um, yeah, it's not a good story. I mean, it'd be nice to be able to tell some great story about how there's all this potential to do all these wonderful things and everything is just great. But it's not. It's exactly the opposite, actually. It's so bad, we should all be hysterically weeping and um, just as scared and horrified and dismal as we could manifest to have any kind of mm, coherency to the reality of the circumstance. But psychology saves us from reason, it saves us from the truth. So most people worry about exactly the opposite, uh, the stuff that doesn't need fixing, and they do nothing about the stuff that does. And they see the world um, through the rose-colored glasses of some perception that makes it all make sense by just pretending it isn't what it is. So the truth of our construction is evolution, so that's the place you begin. But I'll tell you where it's going to end. Um, and it ends in a game you're playing where all you can really do is clean up the mess your existence creates. The living organism is a need machine. It creates needs. It will need to consume and reproduce uh, through addiction and in a parasitic manner. And that's the function. That's what evolution makes. And through that, through just living that, uh, you create a liability. Now the one saving condition is there is so much bad existing in the environment you exist in that you can do a lot of good by eradicating a lot of bad. But it's only because there's too much of it. <laughs> there's only because it exists previous to your existence that you can justify your existence. And that's what many people try to do to rationalize or defend, but that's just a defense from the fact that um, I personally am doing okay. My personal um, contribution is significant, um, compensating, justifying, but it doesn't change what life is itself, and you have to count all the bits, not just the privileged bits. You can't just look at the you know, the slave owners in their palaces um, sipping their tea and pretend that it isn't paid for, uh, you know, by the guy with the wounded back, um, you know, doing all the work. That's the truth of life. And people, I say you can't, and obviously people do, though. They just pretend they're not people. They're thems. They're something else. I don't have to worry about it. It's not real pain. They don't. Animals don't suffer. They just come up with a lie <laughs> to evade uh, the facts that you can't really play this game in any sense. It's a negative sum game. In in ultimately, I mean, if you played it perfectly, if you had some mechanism where you could put this all together and say, "Let's do life perfectly," you'd have something that still wouldn't be worth doing because it has no. It can make no profit. All it can do is make a mess and instantly clean up the mess. Um, but even that, even the mess existing for an instant would still be the mess existing for an instant. And that's really what it is. It's, a, it's an engine that runs on the negative condition, not the positive condition. And that's sort of been illustrated in some semi-popularized books like Better Never to Have Been by David Benatar, where he talks of an asymmetry. And the asymmetry is sort of illustrated by the fact that you don't weep for the non-existent Martians. You don't weep because for the two billion other people that could 
practically exist. Uh, you know, the world could be a little bit more crowded. And you're not weeping because there's all these extra lives that aren't existing because we haven't subsidized or had a you know, government program incentivizing their creation. Because most of you, I think, know um, that there's no tragedy in not existing. Um, the tragedy only comes when you exist and you need and you have an unsatisfied need. That's what seems tragic. And just that in itself, logically, you could say, well, there, isn't that sort of an illustration of the problem, a bigotry we have, where we can empathize with a thing that exists because it exists, but the thing that never existed somehow is doing exactly the same thing as the thing that ceases to exist, and yet somehow the thing that never existed is in a better condition than the thing that existed and then ceased to exist. We always think that not existing is a bad thing, and um, no, it's a not bad thing. It's not a good thing, it's not a bad thing, it's a nothing, and uh, nothing is in a bad place. Nothing is in hell. Where the opposite condition is, where you extract somebody from hell, that's always a good. Preventing bad is always good. Preventing good isn't always bad. Antinatalism is a philosophy that attributes a negative value to birth and states that it is always wrong to have children. Proponents of the antinatalist philosophy include Abul Allah al Ma'ari, Arthur Schopenhauer, and, more recently, David Benatar. It's been labelled the greatest taboo, and antinatalists are often wrongly dubbed as being angsty nihilists, sad sacks, and suicidal depressives. In this series, I'm going to explore the road to antinatalism. What do you need to accept to become an antinatalist? How do antinatalists reach their conclusions? I'm also going to look at the reasons why some people don't accept these conclusions, and I'll attempt to prove why counter-arguments to antinatalism don't hold up under logical scrutiny. I'll break the road to antinatalism down into seven basic steps, and a separate video will address each one of these steps. Seven steps are materialistic universe, evolution and motivation, recognizing value, nature versus logic, being born versus not being born, the step to ethelism, and a graceful exit. This series deals with the philosophical arguments for antinatalism. Antinatalism compares coming into existence with not coming into existence, and reaches the conclusion that not coming into existence is the preferable state. Antilatalism is not a suicide cult, and comments such as, why don't you kill yourself, although inevitable, are neither productive nor are they welcomed. In the difficult and important case such as antinatalism, our reflexes are most often inadequate. Thus, listeners should temper such knee-jerk reactions towards the messenger and instead independently consider the validity of the message itself. All we're doing is we're delaying our inevitable extinction and creating more people who will suffer and die in the future. I don't find this, that this whole human enterprise of trying to stretch out this pointless and futile and absurd human endeavour, just delaying the inevitable, honourable or purposeful at all. It's, it's an abomination and I don't appreciate being brought into this world by people such as yourself who take no accountability for their reckless procreative decisions. I've been extremely disturbed about how much pain, suffering and death has occurred on this planet for the last, what, two billion years? It seems strange that you're disturbed about a little bit of antinatalism that's uh, become accessible on the internet.
It is often quoted that life is a journey, not a destination. But does this really explain what life is? The metaphor is wrong in so many ways. It implies that life is to be experienced without the necessity of accomplishment, that life should just be played for the fun of it, that we should live life like a tourist rather than someone responsible for maintaining a location worth visiting. In most cases, a good journey or trip does require a great deal of planning. Life is work if you're going to do it well. I would argue that life is more than playing the game. It's accomplishing the goal. And the goal or destination of a good life is to live a good life. And that won't come easy or cheap in terms of personal sacrifice. Your life is more than what you experience. It's what you cause to be experienced by others. Your life will have a function. It will produce an end net product in terms of your effect on yourself and the world. Anti-natalism. It's pro-creative. The, the point is, is that if I take away all of the negative conditions inside your physiological body, your physical body, and your psychological worry machine, I take away all the the the, uh, the unsatisfied uh, desires and all the um, pains and miseries and tensions and irritations and all the stuff grating on you, you will just slide right into bliss. So it is not, bliss isn't something you acquire by getting somewhere. It's about staying out of the quicksand. It's about not sinking. It's not about floating. It's about not sinking. That's the nature of how this mechanism works and so that sort of goes back to evolution and a more sterile view of evolution and understanding what it does it's a replicating molecule and what does it do it makes errors so that's the key to one of its functions here is it has to be able to change things and the, and the change is made by making a mistake technically by not copying correctly and what, what do the errors do? The errors compete with each other. And how they compete with each other? By making the instruments of war. By having uh, hardware and desire software uh, molded to fighting uh, for your existence. Um, being a selfish asshole is much of what drives human beings. Um, but there's so much to the desire mechanism it's in the sense that we can see how much it owns us, and especially the most primitive part of it, food and sex, food and sex, um, built around this whole idea of ego and feeling good about yourself. And it's just not that complicated. Um, it's all about this acquisition, the consumption, the possession. Um, and that's the war. The war is taking the property, you know, seizing the power, um, and that's the nature of the game. So you have a bunch of error code, a bunch of incorrect copies, fight with each other to create the most efficient fighting machine, uh, dis destroying machine. Um, and the consequences that of that is the fact that most organisms have to reproduce in grotesquely excessive numbers because most of their young will die. <laughs> you know, that they have to have some sort of I'll get over it mechanism, uh, a fighting mechanism, that no matter what happens, they'll keep pushing, they'll keep struggling for that breath of air. Their instinct to uh, maintain will be strong and um, for most of the game obviously it's played by organisms ignorant of their circumstance so I, I could argue that if one of the one of, one of the easiest to illustrate organisms that's just trapped in a, a pretty insidious circumstance is something like a salmon um, okay they're born in the stream <laughs> they get to a big enough size to to play in the ocean they go there because it's better feeding. Um, you know, gobble up a bunch of stuff, get nice, big, and strong. So one day they can swim back up the stream, 
um, struggle, struggle, um, killing each other in a sense with this competition, with this drive, and, and uh, obliging the strong to make it. So it's a, it's just more of this weeding out the weak, uh, you know, just to keep the, the code strong, um, and um, to to get to a finish line where they do this reproducing thing, which who knows if they get anything out of that, um, and die. And so they can, so their body parts can be used by their children, uh, you know, as a box of Wheaties, you know, to, to, to make it back to the ocean, um, as a snack. Um, you just can't get more, you know, circle of life in the worst kind of way. Um, kind of an image. Now if they knew the truth facing the stream and they knew that their compulsion, their desire to swim up the stream, they knew what it represented, which was just a trick by nature to get them to reproduce and die <laughs> and get out of the game, um, maybe they'd say, hey, I don't need it that bad. I, I can get over it. I quit cigarettes. I can quit anything. You know, that kind of thing. They'll, they'll get over it. You know, I quit drinking. I can, I can, I can not go upstream, and they go back to the ocean and play. Um, you know, and perhaps live another thirty years. Who knows? Anyway, um, so but that's the game nature's playing. That's what evolution does, and it does it with this again physical. We you you can see your physical attributes, right? They they're either um, for, for many organisms, we're, we're, you know, we're a little bit like herd organisms. You know, we're sort of family dependent, gang dependent. So we don't have individual skills. We have skills and power. We have the mob skills and the mob mentality. Once the mob starts moving, it's really, we just have the same, you know, mimicking desire to just move with the mob. And uh, mobs are powerful. And, you know, lots of organisms use that as a defense mechanism. Um, kind of aggressively, I'd say, for say, things that are, say, in tribes are more aggressive than things in herds, where herds are just using the convenience of the separation it creates between the weak and the strong, the sick and the healthy, um, in terms of the scattering function and the fact that predators will get confused. Um, but they still have great skills and that when they are healthy they can run very fast um, again they're born on their feet kind of thing they're lots of they have lots of talents for the game even though they look like a prey animal um, they have survival skills they have survival tools and the more overt tools are obviously on the predator um, the one who doesn't have to the ones who's chasing down something who's not chasing carrots or chasing grass or leaves, <laughs> you know, for their sustenance. They obviously have to have a, a higher standard of uh, aggressive weapon. And you can see it in the organisms, and especially when you go down to insects and, um, you know, they're just insidious weapons. Um, vicious. Crocodiles. I mean, come on. Even if it was a bug, right? A crocodile would be pretty intimidating, even as a bug. Um, and that's what evolution creates is these war mechanism tanks it, it creates machines that are fit to survive to kill before they're killed in a sense um, and they're all blended together into some sort of um, <laughs> holistic uh, bloodbath where um, as long as they're, 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 they they maintain each other's integrity, they keep each other honest, so to speak, um, by changing the game constantly and obliging organisms to modify in subtle and sometimes not so subtle ways. Some organisms like dragonflies haven't changed in 300 million years. Other organisms like humans are byproducts of a lineage that changed rapidly and um, substantially um, to find its niche and that was always it you find a niche and and once you gain some skills through that nichery <laughs> through that exclusion from the 
pollution of the masses and you do some inbreeding and do some error making um, then you can come back stronger and win the gold medal so to speak take over uh, be the new error code um, that dominates The concept of drawing straws provides a useful analogy to many human activities. We often accept some risk for some potential reward, but deciding for someone else is very different than deciding for yourself. Accepting a risk and assigning a risk are not the same thing. When you accept the risks of procreation, you assign the risk of procreation. The person you create will get the straw you draw. Risk must be justified when you're going to impose it on someone else. And if all you have as a justification is, I want, or I will take, you should be prepared to defend the superior value you've placed on your own interests. Gambling can be an addiction, and if a need to gamble is your addiction, you should only be betting with your own currency. When playing with someone else's welfare, the safe bet is to make no bet. There is no harm in being harmless. The simple truth is, a glass full of the best of life simply doesn't need to be created, and creation certainly can't be rationally defended when you cannot guarantee against your created glass being half empty, or worse, catastrophically cracked. The Schopenhauer Show So, psychologically, uh, mentally, we're, we're created with these tools of um, modeling the world and 
you know, understanding dimensionality, um, perceived through our senses and codes of different kinds, sounds, pixels, light pixels, um, touch, sensation, different um, mechanisms to give us some information. That information is processed by our brain into a model of reality. And our brain produces into that model this idea of a feeling, uh, a sense of need, want, desire, a sense of revulsion, um, discomfort. Comfort and discomfort, we could say. We could say that things are painted in our world with the idea of that's a comforting thing, that's a discomforting thing, and they're discomforting in different ways. If I, if I stick a syringe in front of you, you know, a little needle, some people will cringe, ooh, a needle. Some people just, eh, who cares, not a big deal. Um, a, a knife, I can stick different things in front of you and you'll have a different emotional reaction based on your comfort. Um, pig versus dog, I mean, you know, some people, you know, pigs are dirty and smelly and noisy and eh, ugly, and dogs are cute and fluffy and, you know, you know, you get what I'm saying. You'll have good association, bad association, those associations are created by a sense of the thing that takes this form of a feeling. Now we know we can physically have feelings that are just awful. You can feel horrible. You can have a intense pain that is like a, uh, an obnoxious electricity flying through you. This this feeling of a you know a unceasing, unrelenting jab to your sense of comfort. Um, and you can have this opposite feeling of the extraction of say, uh, the pus of an infection, the, the sneeze, uh, you know, a little taste of it you get here and there where you've released something, a tension, a pain, a misery. Um, you pop a muscle into place or something, and ah, this ah feeling. And yeah, that's, we're driven by your brain creating those kinds of associations to create your desire mechanism. So it makes you hungry um, by creating this uh, sense of comfort is just over there. It's like it creates the idea of you're cold and you will be warm if you find this food uh, and consume it. And so we're kind of driven to these things by this perception that where we are is no good anymore. Your body makes you feel unsatisfied, just uncomfortable where you are and you need to be somewhere else um, and uh, it motivates you you know through these basic um, mechanisms. I mean they're, they're kind of crude, right? I mean food's crude, sex is often very crude um, in terms of what stimulates um, the activity and the mechanism um, and these are just the mechanisms of evolution that drive us to do something. So the real point is, is that what you find out if you analyze these feelings that you have, is that the, it is the elimination of the negative that creates the positive. The good isn't a concept that's out there to be had until you create bad. Good really only has meaning when you create bad. Just like freedom only really has meaning when you create the concept of a cage. It, it's completely dependent on the negative condition, the absence of. And it's the absence of comfort that provides the opportunity for comfort. You first have to kind of take it away uh, before you can gain any ground. So you sort of have to sink before you can get back to the surface. And when you get back to the surface, you'll think you're in heaven. You think, you'll think you've gotten somewhere um, substantial because the bad is so bad. So the subject is this ethelism, which is basically an acknowledgement that the problem with this life game goes 
all the way to its core. It's life itself that's broken. It's not just human behavior. It's the entire kind of crazy circumstance where a bunch of broken things, errors, are killing each other to be king of the pile of error um, for no good reason except they've been compelled to do it like a salmon's compelled to swim up a stream. Um, there's no logic involved. There's no reason involved. There's no, oh yeah, that's a good idea. No. It's all just psychology. It's all just a visceral stomach either accepting or rejecting um, and that shouldn't be deciding what we are, or who we are, or what we do uh, because we do have intelligence so we do have this advantage of having created language found a way to communicate what we understand, what we feel and what we think to each other and explain why something stupid and I'm trying to explain to you why it would be stupid for you to think there's something good about imposing life on something that doesn't need to be alive it won't be deprivated if you don't make it <laughs> it will win in the sense that it's you can't do anything to it but whip it and then heal its wounds you will just torment it and then make it feel better um, and say that's a good idea you'll break it to make it and there's no point in doing that it's cruel because what if you don't make it what if you break it and it stays broken that's the, the again people like to think it's all going to work out I'll make it work no sometimes it doesn't work out the tsunami comes and the kids die and that's what happens it's not there's no working out <laughs> there's pain and horror and suffering and misery and that's the price paid for the game you're playing your optimism is made out of their tragedy your pulling the long straw um, is made out of the guy who paid, pulled the, law, the, the, the short straw whatever gratification there is and oh I got the long one well your gratification is being paid for by the guy who's got to deal with on the short one. Um, it's the price paid. You can't just pretend it's um, playable. And I guess part of it comes down to the fact that people do think they have profited. Like, um, I've lived a good enough life. I had a good enough time and I didn't have too bad a time. So it was all okay and somehow I won. And in theory, I don't think that really happens. Um, the richest man in the world will die. <laughs> you know, and we don't have his after death testimony. We don't I mean, many people testifying to how great life is or people who haven't had cancer yet and they haven't done a lot of things yet. Um, maybe they haven't experienced their worst suffering yet. And so they're they're testifying from ignorance. Um, and you know, some people might be improved in their perception by brutal experience but there might be still some people who are just never going to let go of the idea that they're playing a profitable game the game is worth playing because they're so cool and um, just for their existence alone it's worth it Once in a castle long ago, there lived Dr. Frankenstein. The doctor was an evil, sadistic shithead of a fucktard who delighted in creating and imposing life on as many beings as possible. MUST POPULATE! In his lab, the doctor had two powerful buttons, one big green button and one big red button. Dr. Frankenstein never pressed the red button because it was the big red button capable of ending all existence in the universe instantaneously. Why is this even here? But Dr. Frankenstein loved his big green button, for whenever it was pressed, it allowed him to create strong, healthy, and beautiful creatures who were the happiest people the world had ever known. Bye-bye.
However, for every ten of these stupid happy creatures, a Frankenstein monster was born. Oh, life sucks. Hideous, diseased, blighted with a thousand horrors, miserable. Oh, fuck. Out, out, out. And banished. Some Frankenstein monsters couldn't take it and killed themselves. Others realized that if they killed themselves, Dr. Frankenstein would just keep on making more monsters, more harmables, and more misery. The monsters looked at the stupid happy creatures and realized, We are the cost of this! We are the price paid! And so there was only one thing left to do. It was time to pick up their axes and storm the castle! Hello, Doctor. Are you surprised to see me? Ah, you! Stop making feeling things. No! You didn't ask my permission to be born! Ha! I don't need your permission! The happiness of most of the creatures I create justifies your life of suffering! Ah, ah, ah. They serve no function in the universe. They fix nothing. Nonsense. Life is a great idea. Why don't you just kill yourself? Because then I wouldn't be able to stop you. Oh shit. No, don't. Again, you can sort of reveal this egocentric psychology by just talking about the non-existent Martians, or the non-existent Uranians, the non-existent Munikins, and just talk about how you haven't spent one second of your existence contemplating the non-existence other species and other life forms that could be existing on some other planet and don't, and lamenting the horror of their absence and just how terrible it is that they didn't have a chance to squirm about with their big ego feeling all full of themselves while other of their own kind um, live tormented and harassed and brutalized. Uh, yeah. So, you know, they're, the, the, it's really just a in some respects, like many of these arguments, it's you're not really having an ar an argument with facts. You're having an argument with psychology. You're, you're having an argument with what people want the truth to be, um, and uh, a bias. Um, David Banatar, who wrote the Better Never to Have Been, spent a lot of time talking about optimism bias and how we don't see the world as it is. We see it as we clean it up um, for the purpose of feeling good about ourselves and rationalizing our own behavior, and rationalizing our needs. Um, we just don't personally want to have to account for um, real risks and real consequences we impose on others. This is just unpleasant. It's not fun. And 
clearly we are capable of um, the the instincts, the programming built in, the selfishness built in is strong, and it takes strong principles. It takes a strong understanding of um, perspective, truth, a passion for it, to overwhelm your personal interest in not seeing the truth, um, that you are driven by not good things, but pretty negative, selfish compulsion, and that you're bending the rules, you're cheating the facts to make it all make sense. And, um, you know, whether there's two, uh, like many things, there's two ways to approach it. You know, you have the, the predator strategy or the prey strategy. The idea that you can either have a very strong devotion to philosophy or your philosophy can be um, capable of humiliating your psychology, providing you with knowledge of your superficiality and your... Um, the fact that you're not a hero, that you're not great, that you're not even good, that you basically suck, and uh, it can break you down, break down that ego, break down the, the, the power it has over you, humble you into obedience to better ideas than what's in it for me, because it's not about what's in it for you. Clearly, the physical universe doesn't work that way, and the community of living things, although we can divide it into living things that can feel and be harmed, and living things that do feel and can be harmed, and you can understand that the game, as we're playing it, is about those things that can be harmed, where bad can be generated, and... Um, you have to be cognizant of what bad you're imposing, directly or indirectly, to have what you want. And I would argue it's incalculable, um, but large. I would say to you that, you know, as much as you like to think, well, I have a, I have a good, you know, green footprint, or I'm this or I'm that. No, you're not even close. Um, millions of organisms maybe billions of feeling things have had to swim up stupid streams and die to provide the biosphere you're existing in. You're entirely dependent on this mass murder that takes place every day. Seagulls poking the eyes out of little baby sea turtles and whatnot. It's all part of the price paid uh, for you to believe, breathe your oxygen um, and live in your temperate climate and all of that crap. And then what you eat is made out of it also, <clears throat> the decomposed um, parts are constantly getting recycled, and um, that's the truth of what it is to be alive. To be alive, you have to kill a lot of stuff. Uh, <laughs> you know, you have to do the opposite of living, you have to do some dying, you have to make a lot of dying happen and with it a lot of suffering, because that's how things die. That's another fact of evolution. So there's no just turn the machine off But The machine doesn't turn off, it's forced off. It's, it's invaded little pieces at a time, tooth at a time, claw at a time, um, until it has so much damage, the mechanism stops working. And the consciousness will have to experience that. It'll have to experience the pain and the suffering and the torment and the horror of that deconstruction. It'll have to witness it and feel all of it. And that's not a bargain. So, um, yeah, summing up. It's not a good story. And we're driven you know, to find food, sustenance, comfort. And we find no comfort in tragic stories, I suppose, unless we can always have, they have a happy ending. 
<laughs> you know, are they're spiritually uplifting in the sense that there's some redeeming hope made out of the tragedy. The silver lining and the rainbow will fix it all. Um, these kind of narratives um, to persevere, um, to um, somehow the, the lesson to be learned is, is um, fighting is better than nothing at all or something like that. Um, and it's not. <laughs> you know, torturing things is, is no way to live. Uh, it's not a legitimate profession. And that's really the only job on Earth. I, I, like I said, for, for us, we have an advantage because we have this intelligence and we can see obvious problems and fix them. You know, if there's an animal with its foot caught in a trap, we can pull the trap open and bandage its leg and we can fix things that are broken. But the truth is that that kind of good is made out of a bad that shouldn't exist in the first place. The animal's leg shouldn't be in the trap. Um, we shouldn't have been made vulnerable in the first place for you to <clears throat> you know, create a shield that will stop the, the AIDS virus from getting you. you know, these are conditions we shouldn't have found acceptable in the first place. And the fact that we can mitigate against some of them, we can find some control mechanisms to um, stop the horror, um, penicillin and um, novocaine, uh, some morphine, some way to mitigate against the horror, reduce it. There's no reason to sit there and say, let's endorse the circumstance because it will always, it'll have its day. The, the, the predator's going to change and it's going to modify and he's going to come back stronger. And that's what happens. Um, and we're just becoming weaker because physically and more vulnerable. With every passing year our genetic code gets more and more uh, dysfunctional uh, physically and um, we're living a life of comfort that is exploiting so much energy uh, that we're soiling the environment. And these are conditions exposed in the Doom episode, um, but they're just more evidence that we're almost obnoxiously stupid and belligerent, <laughs> you know, to just accepting and acknowledging this is what the game is. And yeah, let's try to play out our existences um, in some sort of civilized manner. Um, but you don't press the redo button. You don't, you just don't do that. You don't say, make more of it. More, make more mess makers that clean up, you know, 30% of the mess they make. I mean, you can do the math. It just doesn't add up over time. You end up with a huge remainder of mess <clears throat> that never gets cleaned up, that just suffers in a mental institution or burns to death in a car crash. Quit imposing horror on sentience by needlessly voting for it. Yeah, simple enough. Anyway, till next time. There'll be a next time, round two. We'll do it better. Yeah. Probably, most likely. First of all, just because suffering is experienced subjectively doesn't mean suffering isn't real. Ultimately, this concept is just bullshit. I don't want to go into a really long uh, waste of words here describing what we mean by suffering because we all know what it fucking means already. We know what suffering is. It's the thing we run away from on a daily basis, people. The thing we avoid like the plague. Maybe not enough folks have endured enough of the real thing to uh, quite appreciate its true depths and its uh, true uh, realness. Real intense suffering sucks, folks. It's not the little muscle spasms you're uh, feeling uh, in your legs when you ride your bicycle up the hill. It's not that teenage girl uh, getting I Wove Mickey tattooed on her ass cheek. These are trifling shadows of true suffering, the physical or emotional kind. 
and to even begin to equate them is an insult to those literally millions and millions of people throughout history who have endured excruciating harm and distress in the form of wasting diseases, natural disasters, and uh, mental desolation. What the hell's so hard in understanding the concept of suffering is bad? How is it that we can so deceive ourselves for the sake of a life lie? That life lie being that life is basically good to the degree that we're justified in propagating it. That we can turn a thing like suffering around in our heads and make it a good thing. I'll tell you what. Give me a pair of pliers and five minutes alone with anybody who thinks this way and let's see if I might not change their fucking minds. Let's see how much they value what's being done to them for the life lesson they're learning. Honestly, some people have their heads crammed so far out fantasy's ass, there's really not much hope of them ever seeing reality for what it truly is. Maybe the message of antinatalism is a little too sophisticated for some of these folks. Maybe somebody just needs to run a channel of flowing images depicting suffering in all its many forms 24 hours a day. Since the human brain is heavily wired towards sight perception and emotion, uh, maybe a barrage of this kind of imagery might finally stick in the craw of these airheads. I, I don't know. It's just a fact that suffering sucks. In pondering existence, the fact of evolution is an important contextual consideration. Life is replication for the sake of replication, initiated to serve no reasoned purpose. Life is properly metaphored as a gladiator war, for no prize but the victory of making superficially defined thems fail. Life is a game umpired by the mindless crude force of natural selection and there is no decency or fairness enforced. In the game of life, the thinking mind came after the mechanism, and originally only had the low purpose of making the other competitors die faster. Now with our educated high mind, we ponder the bloody game, and ultimately question whether this game, or any life game, can be rationally played. Every parent is guilty, convict them Every womb, every cradle has a victim 
every cradle as a victim We are doomed, but try not to doom anyone else as much as possible. Try not to impose as much as possible. Just being alive makes you a taker. Your every happiness paid for with another sentient creature's suffering. You are, in fact, an asshole. Try not to be as much of an asshole as possible. It's extremely important for all of us to understand the myriad ways in which we can, in fact, be extremely dangerous in this world. Try not to impose as much of that dangerousness on the rest of the world as possible. No matter how small you are, no matter how powerless you are, you will in fact have an impact. Use whatever power you have to minimize the suffering. Please?